Good morning again, everyone, and welcome to today's panel presentation, The Path to a Vaccine for COVID-19. My name is Amy Zarzechny. I'm an associate professor with the Johnson Shoyama Graduate School of Public Policy at our University of Regina campus, and it is my pleasure to be your co-moderator for today's event with my colleague, Dr. Barbara von Tigerstrom from the University of Saskatchewan's College of Law. The Johnson Shoyama Graduate School of Public Policy, or JSGS, is a provincial center for advanced study and research in public policy administration. We are a partnership between the University of Regina and the University of Saskatchewan with physical locations on both campuses. This event today is co-hosted by the University of Saskatchewan's College of Law, and we'd like to thank the college for their support and assistance in bringing this event to fruition. At this time, I would like to acknowledge that although our panel is an online panel, our two institutions' physical homes are located on Treaty 4 and Treaty 6 territory and the traditional homeland of the Métis. To help this, uh, this morning's event run smoothly, we would ask that everyone please keep their cameras off and their video on mute during the presentation portion of the panel. Uh, you'll then be invited to unmute yourself if you wish to participate later and ask a question. In terms of the format for today, each of our three panelists will present for approximately 15 minutes, following which we will have a period for discussion and uh, question and answers. And we do hope to have a very rich and engaging discussion. If you have a question and would like to participate, please send me a direct message via the chat function. Again, it's Amy Zarzechny, Z-A-R-Z-E-C-Z-N-Y, and I will be moderating the question portion. When it is your turn for a question, I will invite you to unmute your microphone and ask it directly. However, if you prefer that I read it out on your behalf, I'm happy to do so. Please just indicate that when you send me the question. Uh, please also note that as with all of our events, this morning's panel is being recorded and will be made available at a later date on the JSGS website. So with those formalities out of the way, I will turn uh, the mic over to my colleague, uh, Barbara von Tigerstrom, to introduce our panelists. Thank you. Okay, thanks Amy, and thank you everyone for coming and to our presenters. Um, I will begin with uh, just introducing our first presenter. I'll introduce each of them uh, in turn before they begin their presentation. Um, but uh, the order that we'll be doing is uh, Claudia Emerson first, then Patty Zettler, then Tanya Bubula. Um, so Claudia um, Emerson is uh, from McMaster University where she's an associate professor in philosophy uh, and the director of the Institute on Ethics and Policy for Innovation. And uh, she has been part of a WHO working group that has been uh, dealing with or and addressing the topic that she'll speak to us about today, uh, the ethics of human challenge studies for COVID vaccine. So uh, over to you, Claudia, thank you. So thank you very much. Uh, thanks uh, for the invitation to speak today. I'm really delighted to be part of this panel on this topic, which is obviously of tremendous importance and um, obviously of great interest and not just uh, to the scientific community. Uh, there's obviously everyone on, on planet Earth, I think right now is very interested in a uh, COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, my presentation today is going to be on human challenge studies uh, for COVID uh, vaccine and it's the role that they can play and I will be focusing primarily on some of the ethical issues that are raised uh, when we use these types of studies to try and expedite vaccine development. And expediting a vaccine development is uh, what has been of central interest in, in, this, in the vaccine space, particularly around the novel coronavirus. So we've all heard, um, you know, the numbers, um, how long is it going to be before we get a vaccine? It's one year, it's 12, 12 to 18 months. So this is the numbers that keep playing out. And uh, these are actually uh, quite uh, accelerated timelines. And in fact, many in the scientific community are in sheer disbelief that we could actually generate a vaccine uh, this quickly for a new virus that we actually don't know all that much about. And um, part of that is because of the way the vaccine development pathway is set out. So ordinarily, vaccines take anywhere from 10 to 25 years to develop. Uh, these are very uh, lengthy, uh, it's a very lengthy process. It, um, it is an expensive process, approximately $3 billion uh, to $6 billion to develop a vaccine to move along all of its uh, um, phases, right? From preclinical development all the way through phase one, phase two, phase three, and then uh, doing uh, post-marketing uh, surveillance. Um, so it's a very lengthy process. And in fact, um, the fastest vaccine that we've ever developed uh, was in 1967, the mumps vaccine took six years, but ordinarily on average, it takes about 11 years to develop a vaccine. Uh, 
And so we might rightfully be skeptical about how is it that we can uh, get to a vaccine in a year's time. And so part of that, what's going to be referred to uh, probably from, from here on in uh, with, with this pandemic as the pandemic peak of pandemic speed, so the accelerated vaccine pathway um, for a vaccine uh, during the pandemic, um, is the uh, pathway we're in, some of the phases are accelerated. And of course, from an ethics perspective, this does raise uh, interesting issues and careful considerations around whether uh, by compressing any of these steps along the clinical development pathway or by cutting them out, um, if we are putting human subjects at risk, um, whether there are safety um, concerns, whether there are increased risk to the participants, what those long-term effects might be. And so here in the accelerated uh, pathway, we see the example of Moderna, one of the vaccine candidates that's now out in the field, one of the first that got ahead out pretty quickly. And they were able to do in a couple of weeks what ordinarily takes months and even years to do. And part of that was by compressing that preclinical development, which is actually very critical uh, for vaccine development. So in animal studies, you want to show safety, um, that your, your test vaccine is actually not causing any harm, and you want to show the immune response that you're looking for. And so we skipped over that altogether with, um, with uh, the Moderna vaccine getting into human trials. Now, two things happen there. So the FDA actually uh, approved that on the basis that this is a gene-based vaccine and not one where we're normally injecting live attenuated virus. So there's actually virus getting into, into people. And so here, uh, none of that was happening. So there was a sense that this was somehow safer. Um, the other uh, point is that the animal testing actually started on the same day as the human testing. So the concerns around, uh, I think, safety are still valid, uh, particularly since we did not have that data before we, we try this out uh, in humans. And so uh, the notion of urgency and speed with which we need to move to get to a vaccine or a treatment for COVID certainly does put that kind of pressure on um, on developers and on regulators uh, in terms of what the impact is on humans. So one particular strategy that's being explored and that was brought on uh, quite early uh, is this concept of human challenge studies. And human challenge studies are clinical trials where you deliberately infect a healthy human volunteer uh, with a pathogen. In this case, it would be the novel uh, coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2. And that sounds very counterintuitive, certainly, right? So for a period of time, we had about four and a half billion people on lockdown trying to avoid infection. And here, what the study is proposing to do is to take healthy human volunteers and to infect them with the disease that we're all trying to avoid. So it sounds um, like something's wrong here. Uh, but in fact, human challenge studies have quite a long history, and they've been very instrumental in learning about many infectious diseases and have been playing a key role in the development of many of the vaccines that we have. So they actually have a very strong safety record, um, certainly in the last 50 years, very strong scientific and ethical oversight um, with human subjects involved in this. We have over 60 challenge strains, and we've studied about 15 pathogens of public health importance from dengue, malaria, schistosomiasis, um, a lot of uh, influenza, uh, another uh, model. And uh, they are particularly useful for what we call down-selecting candidates. So right now we have about uh, 12, um, the number keeps changing, about 12 different candidates in the field. So that means being tested on, on, on humans and over 140 uh, vaccines under development. So certainly not all of these are gonna make it to market. Uh, maybe none of them will actually uh, make it to market in the sense that they may turn out not to be uh, effective. Um, only 6% of all vaccines under development actually make it into the market. So one way of assessing, you know, which is the best candidates in terms of safety and efficacy to move forward is to do a challenge study. So you would take about, say, 50 volunteers, um, healthy volunteers that are at low risk of complications. So for, uh, for uh, SARS-CoV-2, that would be your demographic within the ages of 18 to say 30, 18 to 25. Uh, you would isolate these folks in a containment unit, ordinarily in a place where these types of studies are done. And you would give um, half of them the vaccine, sorry, the test vaccine, sorry about that. 
You would give half of them the test vaccine and then the other half a placebo. And then you would challenge them all with the virus and see if your vaccine actually had an effect. So there's advantages here in terms of helping to accelerate by only moving forward the candidate vaccines that are most promising. And it tells you quite a bit about the host pathogen interaction, correlates of protection, how is the immune system responding? Um, so it's, uh, there's quite a few advantages in doing these types of studies. And uh, most recently, there has been uh, at least one vaccine that was a cholera vaccine uh, licensed in the US in 2016, uh, on the basis of which it was only from data generated from a human challenge study, which is quite unusual because ordinarily you run challenge studies to down select your candidates, but you still have to go through the full pathway with the large phase three studies. Now, of course, these are quite ethically controversial. Um, on the face of it, you know, we're supposed to not be harming uh, participants and it seems to jar with that where you're bringing people in and you're injecting them with uh, a pathogen uh, to cause infection. And so all sorts of questions are raised around what kind of justifications do we have to do these types of studies? What level of risk can we be exposing volunteers to? So they are competent consenting adults. There's always concerns about uh, paternalism. Uh, nevertheless, uh, there are uh, many commentators who would say there's a, a level of risk at which you just cannot go beyond. Even if people are willing to take it on, it would just be inappropriate to ask. And so uh, a lot of these um, questions and concerns obviously came up when in the early days, back in February, March, when the conversation around human challenge studies started to, uh, started to uh, generate within the community. And uh, interestingly enough, there is an entire group of people, volunteers actually, one day sooner, that has uh, signed up almost 30,000 volunteers from 140 different countries who are willing to step forward and say, you know, I know that there's ethical issues, there are concerns around uh, this novel virus, specifically because we don't know too much about it. Uh, we don't have an effective treatment for it. Nevertheless, we're ready to step forward. Um, but the fact of volunteerism isn't enough. So the community is quite divided on whether we ought to be doing these studies. So from the groups that are trying to develop, there's real value in trying to expedite um, the COVID-19 vaccine. But assuming, given where we are right now in the development pathway with several vaccines in phase two, some of them ready to move into phase three rather shortly. So Moderna announced uh, just a few days ago that it would move into a phase three trial in July. Uh, it starts to seem like it's, it might not be worth it, right? So it may be moot to do a human challenge uh, study because your uh, regular pathway is already moving so quickly enough and we can study the natural history of disease. So why would we expose these participants to risk? What are we going to get out of this? Like the social value may not be there. Um, but there are, there are other reasons to do this. So in the absence of even expediting the vaccine, there is still this question of the correlates of protection, trying to understand transmission from uh, asymptomatic individuals who are infected. And there is still this uh, possibility that we can get the pandemic under control to a point where running your phase three uh, study would just take too long um, and it would not uh, give us the kind of data that we needed because there wouldn't be enough transmission circulating. And so we would then step in with a challenge study to try uh, and, and get more data. From those who are against uh, the, uh, the idea of doing a human challenge study, the idea is, is that it's just simply too risky. And there are a few things, um, there are at least two key points on which they make this argument. So in the first instance, it's this one, that we are too far along in the chain, that this is not going to contribute very much, uh, particularly since getting a human challenge trial uh, off the ground is still very time consuming and expensive. It takes several months to develop a, a purified challenge strain. You have to get the infrastructure in place. There are practical concerns, right? So if you are uh, isolating people in a unit, um, you know, there are healthcare workers that are then confined to that that are not out on the front line um, uh, treating uh, the coronavirus uh, pandemic. So there are those issues. Um, from the perspective of ethicists, um, the question is really, it really depends. You know, how much social value, a lot of it's going to stand on, how much scientific and social value can derive. And it's true that uh, some of the information like gaining the correlates, understanding the correlates of protection and being able to run these studies when transmission starts to drop is actually quite valuable. And so my colleague uh, Seema Shah at the University of Northwestern wrote recently in a science paper around some of, uh, of these issues around uh, the challenge study. So 
The WHO um, in May issued guidance around the uh, criteria for the ethical acceptability of COVID-19 challenge studies. And uh, the WHO's position is not to endorse um, the challenge studies per se. Uh, so they're fairly neutral on this in typical WHO fashion, but it's really to say that uh, if you go ahead, if you are planning to undertake these studies for researchers and developers, there are at least eight criteria that you need to satisfy in order to uh, make the study ethical. And so starting right from the get-go is this very strong scientific justification. And many would argue that given the current circumstances uh, where the pandemic is at with over 9 million infections, over 480,000 deaths, no sense of stopping, and we don't have anything that's really an effective treatment yet. So recently, the announcement from uh, dexamethasone is really for uh, critical patients, and so we don't have an effective treatment yet. And so there might be a strong justification for that. Um, but it's important that for these studies that the potential benefits outweigh the potential risks, and that this is really the key here. So even if you try to minimize risks by very carefully selecting the, um, the population that you're going to study in this case, um, you know, with criteria number six, uh, uh, a population, the adult volunteers that would be aged between the 18 and 30 who are healthy, they don't have other comorbidities. Um, even with those considerations, you still have these odd cases where young people still get sick, they progress to severe disease and they die. And we just don't know what those cases are. So, in light of those uh, considerations, um, it's still um, quite uh, it's it's still quite debatable whether uh, a human challenge study ought to be uh, going forward uh, to support uh, COVID nineteen vaccine development. Some of the unresolved issues that are still remaining is whether, in light of our current positioning in the in the clinical field with phase two studies underway, lots of them moving to phase three. We're manufacturing vaccines at risk, so really hedging our bets, even if they're not super effective, we're willing to take our chances. What is this going to contribute? And so really assessing that social value is gonna be important. Um, one of the more important unresolved issues is this idea of a rescue therapy. So can we justify infecting people with the SARS-CoV-2 when even if they're at low risk of progressing to severe disease and dying, if that happens, what can we offer them as a rescue therapy? We don't have that intervention. And then lastly, it's the translation of these results. So if we do these challenge studies in young volunteers, one of the questions is, will this data help inform um, an effective vaccine that ultimately is going to be of value for the elderly and those who have comorbidities and are really at risk? So um, I'm going to uh, stop there and just uh, say thank you to my colleague, um, uh, Stephanie Rivera on my team, uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, my sponsor. And thank you very much to the audience uh, for listening today. Thank you, Claudia. Perfect timing and a very, very interesting presentation. Uh, I'm sure there will be some questions. I have some, if no one else does. Um, but uh, without further ado, I want to turn things over to our next presenter and then we'll have questions at the end. I think uh, Amy mentioned that. So uh, our next presenter is Patty Zettler from Ohio State University where she's an associate professor in uh, the Moritz College of Law. Um, previously a faculty member at Georgia State University and a fellow at Stanford Law School, uh, among other uh, things. So uh, uh, she'll be speaking to us about emergency use authorizations for potential COVID-19 vaccines following on very nicely, I think, from the, the previous presentation. So thank you, Patty, and take it away. Um, thanks, everyone, for having me. I'm delighted and honored to be on this panel. I'm just going to share second to share my slides with you all. Um, so um, I'm going to be talking, as uh, Barbara said, about emergency use authorizations um, and for, for unapproved COVID vaccines and how we can think about such authorizations as fitting within the broader picture of pre-approval access to unapproved medical products. So in other words, I'm going to be talking about what options manufacturers and patients and consumers have during that lengthy but necessary vaccine development process that Claudia was just discussing. So um, I'm a lawyer by training and I used to be an attorney at the US Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, before entering academics. 
and consistent with my sort of current focus and research and background, I'm going to focus on the US regulatory environment. Um, but I want to say up front that, um, you know, this is, of course, a global issue. And regardless of the precise regulatory requirements, there will be similar policy questions about pre-approval access to vaccines or emergency access to vaccines, um, sort of whatever the specific regulatory requirements are. Um, so I'm going to first talk a little bit about the regulatory environment and history giving rise to pre-approval access in regular non-pandemic times. Um, then I'll talk about FDA's authority to issue emergency use authorizations and during public health emergencies and how we should understand those authorizations as one kind of pre-approval access, just as we understand things like special access programs or expanded access or compassionate use or right to try or whatever term we use uh, to, to be pre-approval access. And then third, I'll talk about what specific, uh, I'll talk about pre-approval access concerns specific to vaccines, particularly because conversations about pre-approval access often focus on interventions for sick patients rather than potential vaccines for healthy, um, healthy people. Um, so uh, before I get started, I have uh, a couple of disclosures. Um, I've been retained as an expert witness on behalf of certain plaintiffs in two antitrust lawsuits uh, against uh, pharmaceutical manufacturers in the United States. Um, and I am currently serving as a consultant to my former uh, employer, Georgia State University, on, a, on um, tobacco and nicotine research funded by FDA and the U.S. National Institutes of Health. Um, also, because I am a lawyer, I have a disclosure, which is that although I am a lawyer, I am not your lawyer, uh, which is to say everything I'm saying is um, for educational and informational purposes only um, and not legal advice. Um, so as uh, you know, we all know, and as Claudia was just talking about, new drugs and vaccines generally cannot be sold in the United States until and unless FDA approves the product. And of course, other countries have similar requirements and similar regulatory bodies. To obtain FDA approval, a drug or vaccine must be shown to be safe and effective for its intended use. Um, the actual standard for vaccines and other biological products under U.S. law is safe, pure, and potent, but FDA interprets this to mean safe and effective, with effectiveness being demonstrated by substantial evidence. Uh, so how do companies generate that substantial evidence of effectiveness? It's the process Claudia was just talking about, right? Uh, companies generate a significant amount of information. Um, typically starting with preclinical testing and then uh, moving on to clinical trials in humans. And we require this extensive time-consuming process and government permission to market medical products on the theory that it will protect, physically protect patients from unsafe and ineffective products, as well as on the theory that it will ensure the production of information about medical products that healthcare professionals and patients need. Um, so to paraphrase a former FDA commissioner, Dr. Margaret Hamburg, it's not innovation if it doesn't work, right? We need to know what works and what doesn't. Um, but of course, this, uh, as Claudia was talking about, takes a long time. Um, so in the face of this delay, patients who face serious or terminal conditions are sometimes willing to forego the greater certainty that comes with extensive testing and may push for earlier access to specific medical products. And you know, there's been lots of controversies and lots of debate about whether FDA and regulators set the bar for safety and effectiveness too high, unduly delaying patient access, or instead maybe set it too low, permitting ineffective or unsafe products on the market. So this slide shows you some pictures and headlines from some of the more high profile controversies in this area of the US. Um, so for example, in the 1970s, cancer patients sued the FDA for access to an unapproved drug called Laetril, arguing among other things that the statutory requirement for FDA approval should not apply to drugs for terminal conditions. And ultimately the US Supreme Court um, held in favor of FDA on statutory interpretation grounds. Um, in the 1980s, before, um, before there were approved treatments for HIV and AIDS, uh, patient activists, patient advocacy groups, among many other things, protested in front of FDA and uh, lobbied for quicker access to drugs and quicker approvals. Uh, in the mid-2000s, a patient advocacy group called the Abigail Alliance sued FDA, arguing that 
terminally ill patients have a constitutional right to access drugs and medical products before they are approved. A federal appeals court in the United States rejected that constitutional argument, and the Supreme Court declined to take up the issue, and so the law of the land of the U.S. as it stands is that no such constitutional right exists. Um, and finally, uh, in the last five or six years, uh, this issue has sort of arisen again um, with U.S. states passing so-called right to try laws, and in May 2018, President Trump um, signing into law a federal right to try act um, in the United States. Um, and these debates are, of course, not limited to the U.S. Uh, just a couple of examples from elsewhere include um, controversy around access to unproven stem cell interventions uh, offered by the Stamina Foundation in Italy, um, and uh, seeing some of the, the right to try language from the U.S. Um, leak, uh, leak into Canada in the last five years or so as well. Um, so I mentioned all of this to make clear the questions about how best to balance the need for evidence of safety and effectiveness against patients' understandable desire for and need for early access are, are not new. And although they are perhaps more urgent or have different characteristics right now in the pandemic, um, they're not necessarily unique to the COVID-19 pandemic either. Um, and uh, indeed, recognizing this tension between access and evidence, FDA has long permitted pre-approval access um, in sort of normal times um, for certain patients, um, at least since the 1970s, and there have been formal rules on the books in the United States to permit this kind of pre-approval access for treatment use outside of clinical trial um, since the 1980s. In times of public health emergency, there is, however, an additional mechanism available to FDA to give pre-approval access. Um, and this is known as an Emergency Use Authorization, or EUA. Uh, uh, the U.S. Congress added authority for FDA to issue EUAs in times of public health emergency in 2004. Um, this is an option that's available to FDA or, and manufacturers uh, when the Secretary of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services determines that there's a public health emergency, and various other criteria must be met as well. These include that the must show that it is reasonable to believe that the product may be effective for the relevant condition. So that's a bar that's decidedly lower than, than the substantial evidence of effectiveness that's needed for FDA approval. And this lower standard is precisely why I think we need to understand EUAs as pre-approval access, right? Products that are issued EUAs are not equivalent and not supported by equivalent ev uh, evidence as equivalent to that that supports approved products. There are some protections built into the EUA process, recognizing that this standard for authorizing an EUA is lower. Um, so these include that FDA can restrict how products that are issued EUAs are used. For example, uh, the EUA that uh, FDA issued for remdesivir, Gilead's uh, uh, investigational drug for COVID-19 limits its use to hospitalized patients. Um, EUAs are time limited. They are only in effect so long as the public health emergency exists. And um, FDA can revoke or revise EUAs at any time if needed for public health or safety. So, you know, I think when we think about FDA's power to issue EUAs, I think it's important to recognize that in a global health, uh, a global public health emergency like the COVID-19 pandemic, FDA is faced with um, an even more difficult task than usual. On the one hand, developing rigorous evidence of product safety and effectiveness is no less important and, you know, is equally if not more important. We really need to know what works and what doesn't for COVID-19, and generating this evidence will take time, as Claudia was discussing. Um, on the other hand, there's an urgent need to move quickly, and FDA and other regulators are likely to face tremendous political pressure, whether from other government officials, industry, patients, or other stakeholders. Um, and the regulators may lose public trust if they're viewed as non-responsive to patient concerns. So regulators have to operate among these sometimes competing societal interests and operate among these political realities. 
So um, as of now, FDA has not been faced with a request for a, to issue an EUA for a vaccine, but it has issued EUAs for potential COVID-19 drugs. And we've seen some of these challenges play out already. Um, so the now revoked EUAs for hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine for COVID-19 provide an example. Uh, that FDA ultimately revoked the EUAs, I think, is not in and of itself troubling at all. Um, because the EUA mechanism is designed to permit FDA to authorize products with less evidence than is required for approvals, we should expect that FDA will make what ultimately turn out to be mistakes, authorizing products that um, eventually no longer meet the criteria for an EUA or eventually prove unsafe or ineffective. Um, and we should applaud FDA for revoking EUAs, uh, for you know, continuing to review EUAs and revoking them when needed. Um, but FDA's original decision to issue the authorizations was based on really limited data of effectiveness from two small studies, including one now discredited study. Um, these drugs are approved for other uses and have known safety risks, including risks of serious heart arrhythmias. And, uh, you know, so that safety information was known at the time the EUAs were ultimately issued. And there have been a number of allegations in some of the documents on this slide that there was political pressure for FDA to issue the EUAs. For example, they were issued nine days after President Trump touted these drugs as potential COVID-19 um, therapies. And according to a whistleblower complaint, um, other federal officials in the US were pressuring FDA to issue these EUAs as well. So um, these kinds of concerns about whether EUAs are sufficient, uh, sufficiently high standard and these concerns about potential political interference are probably only heightened when we're talking about vaccines rather than potential COVID-19 drugs. Um, as um, we all know, a drug that's issued in EUA is typically administered to a sick person with no other treatment options, right? And a uh, vaccine, on the other hand, is administered to a healthy person. And this difference in health status will alter um, the ethical and clinical risk benefit calculus. Uh, a COVID-19 vaccine also would be used widely, if not almost universally, across the population and in individuals of varying ages and varying comorbidities and so on. And any COVID-19 vaccine will be introduced against the background of existing vaccine hesitancy. And creating and maintaining public trust in FDA and other regulators' decisions will be more difficult, if not impossible, in the absence of really good data about what the vaccine does and doesn't do. Um, so for all of these reasons, I think developing rigorous evidence of safety and effectiveness and developing that evidence across various subpopulations before permitting the distribution of potential COVID-19 vaccines will be particularly critical. Um, and in a um, forthcoming publication with some collaborators here at Ohio State, we'll be recommending that FDA for those reasons decline to issue any EUAs for potential COVID-19 vaccines and that uh, US, the US Congress reconsider whether um, it's, it's ever a good idea to permit FDA to issue EUAs or this kind of pre-approval access for, um, uh, for vaccines intended for widespread use. Um, so I will end there with that argument that we should be very cautious about and perhaps um, uh, avoid altogether pre-approval access to COVID-19 vaccines. So thank you uh, for your time and I look forward to, uh, to further discussion. Thank you so much, Patty. Um, another really uh, interesting and thought-provoking presentation. Um, and uh, now I would like to uh, give the floor, well, virtual floor, to uh, my friend and, and colleague, Tanya Bubala. Um, always nice to see you again now at Simon Fraser University, where she's a professor and dean of the Faculty of Health Sciences. Uh, formerly um, from the University of Alberta, among others, um, with research interests in, among other things, open science, which she'll talk to us about today. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara and Amy, for the invitation. And uh, thank you all for, for coming in to listen. Uh, so I'm going to take us backwards a little bit into the R&D process for vaccines and drugs 
and think about how we can structure them to improve our efficiency of delivering them at the end of the day. So this is not a normal market. Uh, this is not a normal pharmaceutical market. Pandemics are uh, an example of uh, market failure. Um, because there's very little incentive to actually prepare for the next one. There's very little incentive to produce drugs that may be um, uh, effective against viruses that may never happen. Um, we also see market failures in areas of neglected diseases. So these are uh, diseases that are very common in, um, in lower income uh, areas and ultra rare diseases, although we have been working a lot on incentives to get drug uh, development in those areas. So we need to think about a different way to uh, enable uh, science to respond rapidly, but also to enable science to prepare for what we know is coming. And we know what's coming because we understand that it's quite common for viruses to cross species barriers. So this is a, 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 a pandemic with a virus of episodic origin probably came out of bats, but there's a lot of viruses, including the influenza viruses and some of the, the potential pandemic strains that cross into, into humans out of, out of birds. So we know what may be coming, but we have very little incentive to uh, try to develop drugs to prevent that. And the market here is, is not the regular market. It's, it's not really like a, a private market. When a pandemic hits or to prepare for a pandemic, this is something that is of global significance. And so the payer at the end of the day are going to be governments, their health systems, uh, departments of defense, the, the, the US Department of Defense invests really heavily in this area, and then philanthropies that actually um, pay for drugs in a lot of lower income countries like Médecins Sans Frontières. They're some of the, the larger, largest health providers on the, on the planet. So at the end of the day, also when we have an area of market failure, we want to make sure that when we're developing drugs, we bring them in as at low cost as possible because here we're dealing with a, with a public health crisis, which means we need to get those drugs and vaccines into as many people as possible. And that means doing things at a really, really low cost, like a dollar a day. So our current way that we develop drugs for um, first world markets, uh, where those drugs are prohibitively expensive, um, is just not gonna work in a pandemic. So what do we do? So when we think about the proprietary status quo, there's a lot of things that in, inhibit us being able to do things cheaply and quickly. So um, Claudia also put up um, this slide. You know, we're really trying to take um, uh, the, the route um, for R&D from a sort of a 25 year time span into an accelerated 18 month time span, but do it cheaply. The same thing happens for drugs. We start off with 10,000 compounds. Our systems are incredibly inefficient. Um, we end up with one FDA approved drugs and it's probably around 14 years and billions of dollars worth of investment. So if we're looking at anti antivirals, how do we do that more cheaply and more effectively? And a lot of that has to do with getting the right knowledge, the right materials, the right tools into the hands of the people that can use it and to put all of those big brains to work in a, in, in a, in a form of collective action to accelerate drug discovery. Remember, this is largely paid by philanthropies and government. So this is one of the first scandals that we've seen um, <laughs> about what happens when we have closed data. So closed data means that uh, you have development in parallel with uh, little um, coordination of initiatives. So there's a lot of duplication of effort, but it also means that you don't have access to the, to the data. And so some of the conclusions that are drawn can be uh, sketchy at best. Um, so this was a, a, a paper actually on, um, on, on, on hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine um, that was based on data that was kept behind a firewall that later turned out to be fake so that even the authors of the paper didn't have access to the data, um, something that shouldn't happen. Okay, so why open? Um, so what, it, I'll start out with just saying what is open science? So the open science model aims at accelerating discovery, innovation, and research by encouraging rapid multilateral sharing of data, ideas, and materials without the limitations that are imposed by proprietary systems that rely heavily on patent protection. And by doing this, we raise, raise the knowledge boat for all actors in the system. Um, enabling them to move forward with innovative R&D. And exactly as Patty said, 
innovations mean that they work, that they're safe and that they're effective. So there's a lot of social dilemmas that impede sharing and, and some of those are uh, about money, but some of them are just about the culture and the, of what we do with science. Sharing your data, sharing materials, actually enabling them to get out into the, the, the flows to the people that need them, it's, a, it's, a, it's time consuming. Uh, it takes effort. It's a pain. Um, there's interface glitches in terms of interoperability of, of databases. Um, in the scientific community, our, 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 um, our metric, or one of our main metrics is getting a high impact publication. A publication doesn't mean that it's effective or that it works or that it's innovative. It's, it's just a sort of a step along the way. So there's a concern about being scooped by somebody else using or publishing your data. There's a sense of value. These data are super valuable. Um, I'm going to commercialize it. Um, I'm going to make lots of money. It's, that's the lottery mentality that very rarely happens. Um, there's people that hide behind, um, you know, uh, privacy rules or liability or, or um, some informed consents that are usually more liberal than they, than they appear, especially for de-identified or anonymized data. Um, and then there's this institutional mentality that has shifted to this uh, lottery model of, of proprietary success through tech transfer. So what are the benefits of open? Um, so the benefits of open is that it enables communities of researchers to come together to um, set standards for quality for both data and materials. And it enables lots of eyes on those data and materials, which en enhances our ability for quality control. It enables reproducibility. We have a reproducibility crisis in science in general. There's a pharmaceutical company or re researchers from pharmaceutical companies that did a large study where they tried to replicate, I think it was over 200 studies, uh, to see if they could come up with the same efficacy results in animals, and they failed in like 90% of the cases. So we don't reproduce um, uh, uh, the, the results that we have because we don't have access to the materials and the tools to be able to allow this, the experiment to be repeated, which is one of the fundamental tenets of the scientific method. Um, openness avoids duplication because you know what other people are working on. And most importantly, you know whether what they're working on works or doesn't work. There's a lot of data in those preclinical studies that Patty and Claudia were talking about that is submitted to the regulators that is then shrouded in the cloud of secrecy and very few uh, clinical trial results are in fact published. So you don't know whether the molecule or the vaccine that you're working on is actually you're going totally down a blind alley that has already been shown not to work. It lowers transaction costs because one of the biggest holdups to research is negotiating these large collaborative research agreements, deciding on who owns what intellectual property, um, negotiating licensing fees, transaction fees. And so all of that proprietary mentality kind of gums up the works from a, from a transactional point of view. The benefits of open is that universities can do what they do well, which is create new knowledge. And then that knowledge can get rapidly shared into those entities that can actually take it up and use it. So for example, have manufacturing capacity or have medicinal chemistry capacity. So getting that hands into the knowledge of, of um, actually quite often industry more uh, rapidly. It enables tacit knowledge to flow. One of the main ways that universities transfer knowledge is not through licensing agreements. It's through all of that knowledge that is locked in the, in the brains of their really smart people like postdocs and, and, and uh, PhD students that get, then get employed by universities or um, university researchers that go in, and partner and work with industry. And at the end of the day, it enhances um, trust and data in the systems because of these uh, enhanced um, quality control measures. Sorry, <laughs> there's some caveats on that. And that's when we come to what we're trying to do here, which is sort of a global, um, a, a global initiative. There are varied capacities to use data, depending on the state of scientific infrastructure within, uh, within a country and within its institutions. And so um, there's this, uh, there are issues of pushback from um, uh, uh, um, countries whose resources are used without the reciprocity 
for um, advanced development. And we saw this with the, uh, with the bird flu um, that was coming out of uh, Indonesia, where Indonesia, in fact, until they could, um, they negotiated uh, access that for their samples of bird flu, there would be a, um, a, a guarantee that there would be affordable access to any um, therapies or vaccines developed. Um, and so that's, a, that's an example of where there can be tensions between where the biosamples, for example, viral material originate and the countries with industrial capacity. Sorry, I'm having some, ah, there we go. So we're already seeing this developing um, around the world. Um, the OECD and the WHO and a variety of other governments and government funders have established these large um, sharing collaboratives to um, enhance open publication, open data, uh, and really share that knowledge so we can, um, we can accelerate um, R&D in the COVID-19 space, whether it's in the vaccine space or in the, in the drug discovery space. Um, but the problem with these initiatives is that they really focus at that early stage R&D end of things, right? So in that pre-competitive space that is traditionally about being non-proprietary. And there's still an expectation that there'll be a handoff into a competitive proprietary model as we move further down the um, R&D continuum. And the problem with that is in a pandemic is to basically bring it back to what is the target and the goal. This is not a normal market. The market here is governments and philanthropies that need to um, purchase uh, potentially efficacious drugs and vaccines at low cost. And so what this enables us to do is spread this open concept model out of it being a purely um, proprietary, uh, sorry, a, a pr purely focused in that pre-competitive space and to move it into what is normally the space occupied by pr proprietary science. And this means sharing those data on efficacy and safety that are usually um, behind a, um, a, a, a data wall um, at the regulatory offices. It means publishing clinical trial results um, and uh, moving uh, what we would normally consider open um, out of the pre-competitive space into what we would normally consider the competitive space because this is not a normal market. So we're trying to do just that. So I've, I've um, combined with, uh, with joint forces um, with the Structural Genomics Consortium, which is uh, one of the world's greatest examples of uh, public-private partnership in open science, um, to start to think about how do we develop antiviral drugs through um, open science the whole way through, such that we can have antivirals for viral families on the shelf ready to go for future pandemics. And there's an equivalent uh, initiative out of the University of North Carolina um, that's hoping to raise uh, a starting point of $125 million for open science R&D um, in, the, in the US. So in conclusion, I've tried to make the case of, of why open science really matters uh, in this kind of, um, in, in, in the case of a, of a global pandemic. There's a, it's a market failure in pandemic preparedness we're thinking now about COVID-19, but this is a wake up call for the world that we need to be getting ready for the next one. It's not a normal market. The public and philanthropy sectors are gonna be picking up the tab because this is a global public good. We need rapid and remedial action. We need to get quality controlled data and materials into the right hands as rapidly as possible. Um, we need to control the costs of vaccines and drugs for equity of access. And I'd like to make the case that uh, open science is the way to do it. And with that, um, science is hard, but sharing should not be harder. Uh, thank you very much. And I'd like to thank my collaborators at, at McGill and the University of Toronto and uh, at the um, Structural Genomics Consortium. And most of my work is funded by um, CHR, um, Genome Canada, um, and other entities. So thank you very much for your attention. Fantastic. Well, thank you all three of you for those incredibly interesting and, and uh, really insightful presentations. I'm tremendously excited. I feel like we could talk about this for the rest of the day. Um, 
So again, thank you so much for all of that. Again, I would invite our audience members now to please uh, feel free to join in. Send me questions via the direct chat function to Amy Zarazechny, and I will start to moderate uh, the Q&A portion of the event. Um, so as those questions are starting to come in, um, Barbara, I think you indicated you have one to get us rolling. Okay, sure. Um, well, I have lots, but I'll pick one. <laughs> um, so, uh, this question, I think, would be most directed to Patty and then uh, Claudia. Um, Tanya, feel free to pitch in, but I have questions for you as well, if we have time. Um, but a common dynamic with, um, just thinking back to, um, it's a while since I looked at special access, but it, it's a common dynamic is people arguing for special access or some kind of uh, maybe emergency use authorization, but some sort of pathway to allow people to use an unapproved product. Um, part of the argument being, I don't want to be a participant in a clinical trial. I, with all of its restrictions on inclusion and exclusion criteria, maybe there's a placebo control and I'm not interested in that. I just want what I think might work. Uh, and as part of so that interplay between clinical trials and some sort of special access pathway uh, and you could play with the policy on both sides to try to to deal with that tension uh, so i'm wondering what that looks like in this space with COVID 19 vaccines and maybe treatment as well if you would like to speak to that and i think um, patty first and then claudia i'm guessing this intersects with your presentation as well i think Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think you're you're absolutely right that in the sort of traditional pre-approval access space, there's often uh, concern if one's in a clinical trial, you'll be randomized to the non-treatment arm and you won't receive the experimental intervention that you're hoping to receive. Um, many places, I would not opine on uh, Canadian regulatory questions in, among this audience, well, ever, but um, especially among this audience. Um, but, you know, in the U.S., the requirements actually um, uh, is that the person who would get pre-approval access outside of a clinical trial is, is generally not eligible for the clinical trial. There's um, that hope to not allow pre-approval access to slow development or repeat development and um, and, and research with the product. In the emergency use authorization context, um, you know, I think things are a little bit different because the, the emergency use authorization goes to the company and it's basically permitted to market. It's, you know, companies are permitted to charge whatever they'd like to charge, which is different than sort of other pre-approval access contexts. And so it, to, um, to patients, I imagine it looks more like the difference between an approved product and an emergency use authorization to the patient receiving the product is going to be less, I think, because it's it's really permission to market, temporary permission to market as you would an approved product um, without a lot of the restrictions either in a clinical trial or um, in traditional pre-approval access. Claudia, yeah. yeah. I was sure. just wondering, especially since we've seen um, stories in the news about people going out and deliberately infecting themselves. I don't know how true they are. I haven't followed it closely, but uh, they, uh, so if there was a vaccine, they would want to try it if, you know, they don't mind being exposed. Uh, if the age, uh, if the exclusion criteria is anyone over the age of 30, that's pretty low, leaves a big pool of people. So I'm just wondering, again, what that might look like in this context. So I guess that does link into, Claudia, some of the um, clinical trial ethics issues. Yeah, and um, I think so. Uh, so my comment on this actually picks up on the emergency use authorization um, points that uh, the Patty was just talking about, but actually loops back to the importance of data and generating evidence based some of the things that Tanya was talking about. So I'll give you an example in terms of a treatment for COVID. So um, convalescent plasma is, um, you know, the plasma that from uh, COVID survivors, people who have had uh, COVID infection, have recovered and now have these antibodies in their plasma. 
which um, are, um, you know, so we have, we don't have a good evidence base for this. So actually this is a treatment that we've used since the Spanish flu. So for over a hundred years, every time an outbreak comes along, we've seen this in pandemic flu. We've seen this in the case of Ebola, where we, we take the plasma, convalescent plasma from survivors, and we give it to people who are generally quite critically ill. But there's an open question as to whether if we could, you know, just take the plasma either in a, on a prophylactic basis, people who have mild disease, those are serious. We actually don't know. And then right now in the U.S., access to the convalescent plasma for treatment of COVID is through an emergency access use um, mechanism. And the challenge with that is that if you're not providing this in the context of a trial, so there is some way, so even if you're not in the trial, if you're not uh, providing this type of treatment um, through a trial and you're not making efforts to collate that data to be able to get. So you have situations where you have like an N of one. So there'll be like a, a, a physician somewhere in Boston who, you know, asks, gets plasma to treat his very sick patient and then he'll follow. And so he has data about whether that worked and didn't work. And then there'll be like another physician somewhere who has like five and somebody's running a little clinical trial, but none of this data ever gets collated. We don't have an evidence base and we don't provide the treatment in the context of clinical trial. And there's actually trials that we can design right now that have, you know, you know, quite interesting designs, pragmatic trials, adaptive designs. There's a way in which we can provide the treatment and still gather the data, which is so critical as Tanya pointed out, it's really essential to gather that evidence base and to do it. And so we don't do that. And so on the one hand, having that emergency access use is important to treat patients, particularly in the context of something like the pandemic right now, where we don't have effective treatment. So, you know, it's, it's an important piece, but if we don't pay attention to that broader piece around generating the data and the evidence that we need, you know, 50 years from now, the same group of people are going to be having this conversation around convalescent plasma and other things where, Oh, we have this, we have anecdotal data. We think it works. <clears throat> I don't know. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Uh, I have a question here for Tanya, and I think it's um, from one of our public policy students, but who's really interested in the open science model that you've quite compellingly um, described here. And they're wondering about your thoughts with respect to the, the sort of policy tools or levers that you would propose to the Canadian government in particular to kind of advance um, our movement along that pathway. Yeah, thank, thanks, Amy. It's a great question. It was actually the slide that I took out because I wanted to make sure I came in under time. Um, so there's a, there's a bunch of things about um, good governance for open science that, that we know. Um, and one of the things that we know is that uh, it works better when it's a little bit of a grassroots movement than necessarily imposed by it from the top down. That said, um, the, there's a, a whole lot of incentives that we can use to, um, to enable open science. First of all, we need to change the way that we measure outcomes of, of, of science um, within our institutions, within our journals, within our funding agencies um, to actually privilege open science. Um, so, for example, some of the journals um, have now moved to at least post-publication sharing of data, so you don't get to publish in those journals uh, unless you share your data, uh, and you need to deposit those data ahead of time. There's a lot of funding agencies that have um, followed those same models, but all, and then there's the, the whole um, incentivization of publishing in open access journals to enable uh, knowledge to be um, more broadly distributed. But as I said, those things all tend to focus on the pre-competitive environment. So they, they focus on the areas where kind of sharing is a little bit easier because it's within the culture of kind of academic science. So the question is, how do you set up the structures to really incentivize it moving forward? Well, you can um, set up um, entities that do the best science, make the best tools, like the Structural Genomics Consortium, which uh, um, puts out um, protein structures, uh, human protein structures, and uh, chemical probes. So identifies targets on those proteins and then puts out chemical probes that you can start the medicinal chemistry um, process um, down the line. Um, so what those enable is public-private partnerships because um, um, the private sector is incentivized to access the best science. And if that best science comes with a, an open science mandate, um, then, um, then that works. Um, and then um, the, uh, the other ways are now moving further down the regulatory pathway where there is some movement with the regulators to at least make some of those, those basic preclinical data of 
um, is there any is there any evidence for this mode of action or do we have secretly sitting in our database five trials that aren't published that show that this mode of action doesn't work um, and yet under our statutory mandate we are still required to uh, authorize yet another trial because we can't tell you that that doesn't work so i think that there's there's incentives there so that's the duplication of, of effort um, and then you know quite frankly um, uh, mechanisms that allow for um, a commitment um, to uh, to break this issue of market failure where you're actually paying for the research to be done to get us to that at least into phase one trials where there's a uh, demonstrated uh, safety and proof of concept of, of, of efficacy to have things sitting on the shelf with the full packages, regulatory packages available such that when that virus hits us as a pandemic, we can pluck that off the shelf and we're ready to move straight into phase two and phase three clinical trials, as opposed to having to do the whole front end first. Um, and that's what we're, 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 we're trying to convince the government to fund us to do. Great, thank you, Tanya. And um, this is a question for Claudia, wondering if you could speak a bit more about the WTO or WHO process, um, and particularly I think the interest is in navigating different ethical standards in different countries around the world with respect to what really is an issue of global concern and how that process unfolded. Thank you. Great, thanks, thanks for that question. Um, so first, the disclaimer, um, I can't speak on behalf of the WHO uh, since I'm not a WHO uh, an officer um, at the organization, but I can tell you a little bit about um, the process for guidance development. So ordinarily what happens is, and it's, it's actually, so it's, it's interesting how the, the guidance for this, for the CHIMS for COVID-19 was also an expedited process. So the ordinary uh, guidance process for the WHO is about a year, so much like the vaccine, 12 to 18 months. And ordinarily what happens is it'll, the mandate will come down from a unit that a guidance is, is needed um, to inform a particular area. And then uh, a working group is usually assembled from experts, which is uh, fairly representative, uh, global representation. And so I didn't put that on the slide, but um, I can tell you uh, our working group had uh, representatives from um, the world over, right? So from North America, from Europe, from Africa, from Asia. And oftentimes what the WHO does is they will tap people that are sitting in their collaborating centers for bioethics. So for example, the drafters of this document were colleagues at Monash University in Australia, uh, Michael Segalid and uh, Zeb, uh, Dr. Zeb Jombrek, who are um, members of the uh, WHO collaborating center there. Um, but we had on this group, and so the expertise is supposed to be multidisciplinary. So we had clinical trialists, folks who do um, CHIM studies, ethicists, uh, policy analysts. So you try to cover um, your, your area well. And so once they strike up that working group, then there's usually a terms of reference that are set for what is it that you need to do. And the WHO process is generally, um, like as I explained in, in the presentation, so uh, quite neutral in the sense that they're not advocating either for or against running uh, controlled human infection studies for COVID-19 vaccine development. They're simply saying and aware that out there, there are uh, proposals being prepared, uh, somebody will fund them, they will move forward. And so in doing so, can we at least, um, you know, hit a standard, have the ethical standards and requirements, since this will have to go through regulatory approvals and such. And so um, for this particular process was quite rapid, it was a month. So we had, we met weekly, um, we discussed the questions, there was debate, there wasn't consensus in the group as very often with these types of things there aren't. So some of us were supportive and wanted to push um, and make the case for benefits and social value a little stronger, others were not, um, but that is generally how it is. And then it goes off to another independent set of external reviewers. So we'll go through an internal review pro process, external review process, and then it gets adopted uh, through their internal um, regime. So that's um, how that uh, system was developed or that guidance. Great, thank you very much. Uh, I have a question and it's for any of the three of you. Um, wondering about the many rumors about purpose of vaccine and issues related to security and privacy that have been proliferating, uh, noting one of them as an example that the conspiracy uh, with respect to the vi vaccine being used to control the world uh, as one, one example of others. But wondering, I think what your opinion is with respect to these kinds of conspiracy theories that we're seeing in this space. 
that's a big and hard question, I know. So, but sure, is anyone I'll willing start. to dive in? Yeah, I mean, I guess I, I'll I'll start by saying, you know, I think vaccines are products for which there are lots of, um, you know, what we might call conspiracy theories or or sort of other kinds of concerns that spread through pop culture or sort of other kinds of misinformation. Um, avenues of misinformation. And so I think that is, you know, there are things about vaccines that are special because they're intended for healthy people rather than being interventions intended for sick people. But that cultural position of vaccines, I think, is another reason why vaccines are special and why um, I, you know, why my, my colleagues at Ohio State and I are, think FDA should, should not be authorizing vaccines in advance of the in advance of at least the sort of satisfying the standard for approval that we normally expect, that we really need that evidence of safety and effectiveness for vaccines before they're distributed. Thank you. Any other, Claudia, did you want to comment as well? Sure. So I, I guess my comment um, simply that, um, I mean, I, I don't think we can avoid uh, these conspiracy theories. Um, they've been around for a long time. Um, we see them pop up every once in a while, you know, they persist. So there's a very strong uh, vaccine hesitancy movement. And, you know, I think the important thing to remember is that I think we have to acknowledge and be respectful that there are just sometimes, um, you know, uh, members of society who are genuinely concerned and not um, and interested in just pursuing uh, other interests and just don't align with some of the public health interventions that we have. Um, that being said, I think that when things start to go off, like, you know, really crazy things like, you know, this has been done on purpose, or I mean, I've heard uh, things like, you know, Bill Gates has been on the CNN uh, town hall uh, quite frequently. And then you see kind of these comments on Twitter is like, oh, of course, he predicted this in 2015, because this is like something that his organization or folks that he works with with the WHO have created this so that we can start this and it sets off a whole chain. I mean, when things start to sort of cross over into sort of these absurd claims, I think we just, you know, you have to kind of draw the line and, you know, that's just not going to go anywhere. But there are genuine concerns for members of society around the safety of vaccines. And as, you know, Patty says, this is, gives us pause to kind of think about, you know, how quickly we want to roll these things out. Um, I think that uh, it's important at the end of the day to remember that vaccines are one of the safest and most effective public health intervention tools that we have. Cost effective. I mean, the reason we're all here and none of us are, at least I, from the folks that I can see on the screen, you know, we're all polio free, we're all measles free, we're all mumps free, at least right now. And this is because, you know, our parents vaccinated us against these things. And so we've got reason to believe and have some faith at least in how we we how we 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 produce our public health interventions and how we roll them out, we've done this before. So I think we have to you know kind of take these things with a grain of salt when they are too far out on the edges. But I think within the role realm of disagreement, a lot of that I think it's just important to continuously engage with some of the dissension that's in the community. Yeah, I guess I'll, I'll add one brief follow up, which is um, I think sort of. Part of what Claudia was saying is, is concerns about vaccines have been around a long time. And when I teach food and drug law, I show my students a slide of a satirical cartoon from the UK or from Great Britain from 1802 of a person turning into a cow after getting a cowpox inoculation. So these sort of concerns about what happens with vaccines are, are you know, not new. Um, so there's something we have to reckon with. Thank you. And this really, I think, is a related question that flows from that. But um, your thoughts more, it's not, it wasn't the subject of any of your individual presentations, but given all of these sort of concerns around vaccine hesitancy, and yet this huge global sort of desperate desire for this vaccine that works and so much really riding on that in many jurisdictions around the world in terms of opening up in various pieces, wondering what your thoughts are with respect to the implications for communication around the vaccine approval process, the R&D process, um, approval processes um, for various stakeholders. And I think there's an interest here in sort of academic scientists, governments, but what, what does all of sort of that co broader context mean for the responsibilities that different individuals uh, engaged in this have with respect to helping the public more broadly understand some of these various pressures uh, and the realities at play? I think in the same way that we've, we're manufacturing at risk, trying to scale up the vaccine, I think it's important now to be thinking about what that communication 
and engagement strategy is going to be with the broader community. I mean, we're following this, you know, very closely. Um, you know, the news is on uh, 24 seven and you hear what's going on. So I think it's really important to think about engagement at different levels. So you have, um, you know, at the level of the public, um, how the vaccine is being developed, where it's coming from, how is it going to reach, how is, how is it going to be accessible? I think it's important to put in place a strategy for that because you're going to have to engage at the level of the public, you're going to, at the level of the community, you're going to have to engage at the level of government. Um, so I think there's a real responsibility on the developers and manufacturers to be thinking about the different levels of engagement that they're going to have to pursue in society and really be thinking now about what that communication strategy is going to be. And I think governments also have a strong responsibility because I think we're going to have to be very clear and very purposeful. And I mean, at the end of the day, to achieve herd immunity, we're going to need about 80, what is it, 85, 90% coverage. And so there's obviously going to be people who are not going to be interested in who are going to reject the vaccine. But if we want the majority of society uh, to accept the vaccines that we are developing and are going to be rolling out hopefully shortly, um, I think it, you have to start thinking about that now and not once we're further down the line, because I think it, it could, could be very complex, particularly in the context of a pandemic um, where there is already heightened anxiety. There is already the sense of urgency concerns that, you know, some corners have been cut and whatnot. So I think it's really important to think about that now in a way that we won't when it's just a sort of your routine immunizations that roll out, um, you know, through normal processes. Okay, thank you. I will let our audience know again here, we have about 15 minutes left. I have a couple of questions left in the queue, but if anyone else has burning issues you'd like to explore with our panelists, please do send them in. We're happy to uh, pass those along as well. Uh, a question I have here, um, I think it's back for, for Tanya most directly, but um, is how, what advice would you give early career researchers who are interested in sort of delving into the open science pathway when they are still functioning within the existing kind of institutional structures that you've talked about as being a barrier? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, so I would say look for, a, look for some supervisors that are operating within the, within the open science framework, but it's, it's much more difficult to be nimble in the system um, when, uh, when you're part of the system as opposed to trying to enter it. But frankly, the system isn't going to change without some uh, some real sort of passion and, and advocacy, particularly from um, from younger investigators. And you know, there's some evidence that early career investigators, at least, are are um, are actually pushing the envelope um, on on openness. Um, so there's there's other. Um, so I would I would say look for the labs that are. Um, operating within a within an, an open science paradigm um, as a really good starting place for mentorship, because they're generally pretty good at balancing the things that stu students need for career advancement. Um, also, remember that um, even if you're working at that pre-competitive stage, there's evidence that says that um, that publication in an open access journal that usually comes with all of those requirements for at least post-publication um, deposit of, of data and transparency of data uh, are more highly cited, <laughs> which is one of the metrics uh, than those that are behind a behind a paywall. Um, generally, if you're if you're working in a lab that can um, afford all of the the open access um, uh, types of fees, then you're generally working in a more uh, well-funded lab to, to begin with. Um, but uh, yeah, we're, 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 we're moving the needle inch by inch. Forward is forward, right? That's great. Thank you. Um, a question I think for Patty, uh, and this is actually, we have got a pause and questions from the audience. So um, I'm just going to ask, I was really interested to hear you very directly reference the political pressure piece. Um, because I think many of us have been watching that um, with some interest, of course, not that we're immune from it here as well, but especially with respect to President Trump's involvement and others um, in some of the discussion space around this. And I would love your thoughts more broadly on how that influences public trust in the regulatory approval process in general. When it, I mean, vaccines are sort of one piece, but of course the implications are broader than that as well. Um, and I know this is an area we've chatted about in different contexts, but I'd be really interested to hear your thoughts about whether this particular context kind of fuels any of those concerns to a, a heightened degree. Yeah, I, um, I think, you know, it's really hard to talk about what the FDA is doing right now without directly thinking about political influence and just is sort of a um, in the weeds legal 
background piece, FDA within sort of the US government structure is an agency within the US Department of Health and Human Services. And Secretary of the US Department of Health and Human Services is part of the president's cabinet. And it's actually under US law, it's actually the Secretary of Health and Human Services that gets to make all of the decisions we think of FDA as making. It's just the secretary has delegated the authority to approve or authorize drugs to FDA. And as a sort of matter of history, the secretary rarely ever overrules an FDA decision, but it has happened um, during President Obama's administration. The Secretary of Health and Human Services um, directed F publicly sort of told FDA not to approve um, emergen an emergency contraceptive over the counter for people of all ages, um, even though FDA had determined, uh, you know, under its sort of scientific standards that a approval was appropriate. Um, so that's sort of the one public instance of it happening. But all of that is to say that the structure of the law actually places FDA sort of underneath um, uh, the law enables the president's secretary of health and human services to overrule FDA if in certain circumstances. So I think especially right now where we're in this pandemic, where there's a lot of, um, you know, political pressure to make progress on developing products for COVID-19, you know, more political pressure probably than FDA has faced in, in recent history, at least, um, you know, it, I, understanding that legal structure, I think, is helpful for understanding how it is that pressure can be exerted on FDA. Um, and so, I mean, I think, um, you know, scientific regulatory decisions are sort of by some nature always political, right? We never have perfect certainty about a product at the time of decision making. So there's always some judgment call. I just, I think the sort of nature of the pandemic just opens the door more widely to um, sort of political pressures and, um, you know, of all kinds to come into agency decision making in ways that might um, more strongly cut against or sort of more strongly push the agency than in normal times. Thank you. I think we have another question from Barbara. Sure. I have an endless supply of questions, but um, one sort of multifaceted there. I'm thinking as I'm listening to all of the speakers and, and the discussion about the global picture and what each of your issues looks like um, globally, very complex. So in um, I don't know, 10 minutes or less that we have left. Um, but uh, for example, Patty, as you were just speaking, I'm, I was thinking about, you know, there's the dynamic of regulatory agencies working together on this to, you know, which they have done before, that's not new, but maybe to a, a greater or accelerated degree, but at, at the same time, tensions between countries in terms of well, if the US is allowing it, we always see pressure in Canada. Well, why hasn't Health Canada approved this yet? Um, so uh, all kinds of complex dynamics there. Obviously, Tanya's piece, you had a slide that was great. Open data uh, does not equal capacity to use and some of the like the dynamics um, between different parts of the world and, and, and countries in terms of you know, sure, give us access to the data. Great. What do you want us to do with it? Um, if I could put it very crudely. Uh, and then Claudia, of course, there's always international issues in terms of clinical trials. Where are we going to do them? Standards in different countries. So um, <laughs> maybe two minutes each, uh, if you just have a reflection. And those are just some ideas that you might comment on, but on the sort of the, the global picture on each of your issues. Uh, Patty, do you want to start since I picked you first? Uh, sure. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. That I mean, I think it's true in the U.S. as well. If something is authorized elsewhere or available, even if not authorized elsewhere, there is a sort of narrative about why is it unavailable here. So I think there is that there is going to be that interplay. I think there's also issues around shortages right now and concerns about shortages in supply chains, which are it's slightly different than authorization or it's sort of a different bucket of how regulators can collaborate or how there might be incentives not to collaborate right now. But I know in the U.S. there's a push to move drug manufacturing back to the U.S. because of concerns that supply chains will be disrupted by the pandemic or 
other countries will keep drugs manufactured there for, you know, their citizens, their populations, um, you know, understandably, and, uh, you know, U.S. populations won't have access. So um, I think there's sort of, uh, there's a lot of ways that the pandemic could um, push regulators from all over the world to collaborate more effectively um, in terms of thinking about authorizations or thinking about solving problems, but there might be um, I guess, returning sort of to Amy's question about political pressures, there might be political pressures that also might um, push against collaboration in some sense if we think about supply chains and shortages. Yeah, great. Thank you. Tanya, thoughts? Oh, so many. Um, so, I mean, global, global challenges need global solutions, and that, that's kind of a pat answer because what that brings in is, is issues of, of, of governance. You know, how do you coordinate activities, not just within your own country, but around the world where there are different strengths and weaknesses um, in different parts of the world? So like what Patty just said, you know, maybe there's research strengths in, in one region, but manufacturing strengths in another. Um, and so I think it always comes back to the principle of what are we aiming for, right? This is a global pandemic. Viruses don't recognize or respect borders. Um, so, you know, we, we do need, we do face some coordination challenges. So what do we know about coordination challenges? Well, there's the big issue. We talked about trust in the, con in the context of vaccine hesitancy, but there's also trust in the enterprise of science, not just by the people that are the end users, but by the people that are actually doing the doing. Um, and so um, things like, um, you know, commercial or proprietary interests can really diminish trust in uh, amongst the actors within a with an enterprise that needs to all row in the same direction. Um, so participation um, by different regions of the world within the scientific um, activities or the R&D activities is absolutely crucial and central to this. Um, building of scientific and research capacity, uh, training of students and other things um, has to be part of the bigger picture. But most importantly, at the end of the day, we want equity of access at the end product. And so there needs to be some recognition that regardless of whether this is developed in the US or Europe or, uh, or China, that there is um, an ability at low cost to access the end, end product for, um, for, for large swaths of the, of the world's populations. Um, and that means you know, developing things, you know, not just rapidly, um, but also very, very cheaply. So there's a whole area um, around that um, called um, social, socially responsible licensing or global access licensing. It's built into um, you know, all of the, all of the res international research um, funding agreements from um, organizations like, or funders like Gates, um, where there is um, this uh, guaranteed um, low cost access, um, maybe with a split pricing model or, or, or other things. But the bottom line is um, you need to have participation in the governance structures of how all of these initiatives are coordinated mm. and not just from the developed world. Yeah, thanks. Claudia, any thoughts from your end? I'm thinking even as Tanya was talking, linking into some of the global equity issues, has that been, I'm assuming that's been part of your discussion? Yeah, so that's, thanks very much, Barbara, for the question. So in terms of the human challenge approach to expedite a vaccine, that is definitely not being considered um, in low resource settings. Um, so that's not to say that human challenges are not something that isn't of interest in low and middle income settings. So the, the bulk of these types of studies are actually conducted in the UK and the US. They have been historically, and part of that is because of the resource requirements. You need the infrastructure, you need a biosafety containment situation. Um, and you know, in the context of the, of the pandemic right now, you would, need, you would need to have adequate uh, personal protective equipment for the staff who would be running the study. We need to have access to ventilators, ICU and all that, particularly since uh, the intention would be to infect people with the SARS-CoV-2 and you could end up uh, with uh, participants in these studies that could get very sick. And so you'd want access to the infrastructure. And in fact, one of the risk minimization criteria that's in that WHO document is the site selection. And site selection sort of points to you want to do with this set of site that has the experience and the infrastructure in place for that. So in terms of the COVID vaccine, there is no intention right now, uh, no discussion around running these in Africa or, or elsewhere. Um, but there is in 
intention and interest on the part of many stakeholders, funders, investigators, and in-country scientists to do more human challenge studies in endemic areas, disease endemic areas for malaria, for dengue, um, and whatnot, simply because uh, the real value that you get out of these studies is in primarily so in, you know, infecting, challenging a college student in Toronto or in Boston or in um, Baltimore with a um, with a malaria challenge is, is not going to be very helpful because we're not exposed to it. And so the real value would come in endemic settings. But you have to be very careful for obvious reasons. It's the safety requirement and also concerns around exploitation. So on the human challenge side, there isn't that. But there is obviously interest um, and considerable interest in bringing and ensuring that there's equitable access to a COVID, an effective COVID vaccine um, in uh, low and middle income countries. I mean, you see what's happening in Brazil and Africa with these numbers going up. It's, you know, and this is a, a question that at the international level is being discussed quite a bit. The World Health Organization and others, CEPI, who is funding, this is the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness um, that's funding the, a lot of the vaccine candidates that are out in the field. And Gavi, which sources and procures the vaccine supply, has already made a substantive commitment to ensure that once we have a vaccine, that there is able, that it will reach uh, folks who really need it um, in, um, in places outside of, of, of the developing world. Um, one of the things that they are doing, so I can say I have some colleagues at the vaccine, the Pan-African Vaccine Regulator at Averef in Africa, who, do, who review these protocols, a lot of tremendous effort and good work has been put into expediting review. So uh, looking at how are we, when the protocols start coming, when vaccine trials, so standard vaccine trials, not human challenge ones, show up on the African continent. Are we prepared to review them? What is there? And so this, the oversight mechanisms, the governance mechanisms that Tanya was just talking about, all of that sort of been put in place and a lot of great work has been done to prepare for that. And in part, that was motivated by what happened in West Africa with, uh, with the Ebola crisis and the outbreak a few years ago. And so in some ways, our colleagues in Africa have been looking uh, towards this um, and are uh, in fact doing a lot of uh, great work to be prepared for the testing of COVID vaccines and, and their introduction and eventual adoption. Great, thank you so much. Terrific. Well, thank you all. I'm afraid with that, our time for this morning's uh, session has come to an end. I want to thank all three of you again so much for sharing your time and expertise with us on this incredibly important topic. And thank you to all our participants for joining us. Um, we're very grateful as well for your time and hope that uh, this session has been informative and engaging. I know it's left me with a lot of food for thought. So please feel free to join me if you'd like in using your reactions uh, function to share your applause with our speakers. Uh, and again, a reminder that this presentation will be posted on the JSGS website for later viewing uh, for anyone who would like to share it more broadly. So thank you again and have a wonderful rest of your day.